Well, good morning. Um, guys, I tell you what, if you have a Bible, do me a favor, open up to Acts chapter 5 is where we're going to be today, Acts 5. Uh, while you're turning there, um, let me set this talk up the right way. Um, so if you were here last week, um, last, well, okay, let me say it like this. Um, when, when you come to church and you hear a sermon, usually at the end of it, you can tell what kind of sermon it is. Uh, and it's going to normally fall into one of two categories. I call them heady talks, like in your head, and heavy talks, like in your heart, right? So like a, a heady talk or a heavy talk. Um, last week was a heavy talk, right? Was, like we talked about and prayed through repentance. We had a time of invitation to come forward with confession. We were all crying. We were snotting and like, like con- I don't know if anybody convulsed. My eyes were closed, but maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it was a really, really heavy talk. And I just thought, okay, this week we could use a, a heady talk. Um, just to give our emotions a break, and just so we can, okay. And, and by the way, um, when it comes down to it, a lot of us, um, before you're like, oh man, I want another heavy talk. Um, like Normally that happens because most of us, when it comes to the way that we receive messages, we're wired in one of two ways. Either we like the heady talk, where we're just kind of like, huh, and we leave it there, or we like the heavy talk, because we love being at like summer camp, with our hands up in the air, and God, I didn't know, and I'm so sorry. Like, we, love, we love those talks. And, and so if, if it's one and you're wired for the other, you feel cheated. If it's the other and you feel wired for the one, you feel cheated there. Um, and, and here's the truth, and you should just know this, but like the longer that you do this thing called faith, the longer that you're plugged into the church, um, you need both. You need both. And the reason that you need both is, like, like God wired you with emotions. Emotions aren't bad. Like, like if a talk stirs your emotions, if the Holy Spirit like intervenes and convicts and confronts, praise God for those moments. But there are also these things that are, that are as important, if not more important, than, than your emotional experience, and that's called doctrine, truth. And you want to know about things. Like you, you want to know like what you believe and why. You want to know this heritage that we've picked up that's been going for 2,000 years called Christianity. Like you want to know what the word says, even when you don't feel particularly like bubbly about it. And the reason you want to know those things is because it's going to deepen you in your faith, because you're going to learn things that stick with you like through life. And the reason that you want to know is that you can pass it on to the next generation. All of us, we've been given this baton for right now. <laughs> But there's going to come a day where we hand it off to our kids, and they hand it off to, to their kids. And, and so, listen, like, doctrine is just as important, if not more important, as experience. I'm just going to say it, it's more important than experience, okay, because your experience can lie to you, but good biblical truth uh, doesn't. And so today we're going to just breathe, just, like, I'm not going to confront you, I'm not going to make you air your stuff today, um, and we're just going to learn some stuff that I think is really important. And so... This leads to Acts chapter 5. Last week, we saw the story of Ananias and Sapphira, where God struck him dead for lying to a church, and now we're going to move on, okay? So Acts 5, starting in verse 12, says this, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared to join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. So just pause on that for a second here. Okay, so the church, be like, because, and and we've been saying this for a long time, like, the the biblical Christianity, it's a supernatural community, right? Biblical Christianity is not a thing of, like, it's about mental exercises. No, we believe we've been anointed by the Holy Spirit, and that to be a Christian is to, like, work with the Holy Spirit to advance the kingdom, and and, and these signs may accompany that there be workings of power because God is powerful, right? And so we're seeing this, that like they're developing a reputation for men. Like God is healing people around these people. And so now like they've got such a reputation that as Peter's walking down the street, people are like, it's that guy. And they're dragging out like their, their sick friends and family members. They're bringing them on mats. They're just hoping that his shadow will fall upon them so that they'll be healed. Now, really quick, is that good doctrine? No. Is it good doctrine that people would think that a human being's shadow, if it fell upon them, that they would be like, I'll be healed now? No, that's elevating the person, okay? But can I just tell you something? God still used Peter to heal. And here's why I bring this up. Sometimes, like, like sometimes what happens is we think, like, we've got these check boxes, and, and they usually lack grace, and they usually, like, lack wiggle room. And we think, okay, if God's going to use someone or something, then they have to have it all right. And by the way, who would ever live up to that? Because all of us are learning. 
all of us are being molded. Like, I, I know things now that I didn't know five years ago, even though I was walking with Jesus five years ago. You know things now that you didn't know five years ago, and the Lord's correcting you and what have you. So if you think it's a thing of, I have to have absolutely perfect doctrine in order for the Holy Spirit to show up, then what's the point of learning? Like, the Lord is molding you at all Times I'm not saying like, that we just give bad, like we have way to bad doctrine. I'm not saying that at all. At the same time, it's a mistake to think, okay, if I just believe everything right, and if I just do it right, then God will. Can I just tell you like another reason that I just want to bring this up? Um, because if Peter were walking around today in our critical culture where everyone and their dog has a Facebook page or a blog, let me say what people would be saying. When they say, okay, like, they're bringing out people and they're, and they're putting them on the streets for, for Peter's shadow. They'd be going, see, it's all about Peter. I knew it. Right? Like, think about, think about what's happened at Asbury in Kentucky with the revival or extended worship service, whatever you want to call it there. And like people like, I mean, they, 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 they were so convicted. They were in the, the presence of God. They were weeping. They were confessing their sins openly. And how many people went, okay, yeah, but they didn't do this thing. And because they didn't do this, it's clearly not a revival, which is always weird to me that, that people defend the term revival so doggedly because the word's not in the Bible. So like why people are like, it's not a revival unless it does this. I'm like, who cares? Like, honestly, like did people draw closer to Jesus as a result? Yes, then shut up. <laughs> like you're why we can't have nice things, okay? <laughs> like, that's, that's mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But like, can we, can we just get past the arrogance of unless it checks these boxes that I've decided it should check? I heard one guy was like, I never heard the gospel proclaimed. I'm like, why would you? It was among the converted. Like what? Okay. Like, and, and so we go like, unless it does these things, therefore. And I'm just saying, listen, let's just give the spirit space to move. If it contradicts the Bible, we'd say the Holy Spirit's not in it. If, it, if the fruit is that people turn away from God or they, their relationship with Jesus suffers as a result of it, okay, we would say maybe the Lord wasn't in that. But if people are inspired to follow the Lord more and they're convicted about holiness and they just want to love Jesus more as a result, like why in the world are we critiquing this? Okay, I'm going to keep moving. And so, so all right, pe people are thinking, hey, if his shadow falls on me as he, as he passes by, uh, we'll be healed. And that's not the greatest idea, but God is still kind. And so it says this, verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits. And we'll get to that, uh, not today, but, and all of them were healed. Okay, so like what we're just seeing here is just massive amounts of healing, all right? And so here's the question that I wanna answer today. Simply put, um, does God still do this? Say it again, does God still do this? Now, here's why I wanna bring this up, okay? Um, years ago, uh, well, he's still my friend now, but years ago, I, I first met my friend, Sean McCarthy, one of my best friends now. Uh, Sean's a pastor uh, in, in Salisbury. We've had him preach here. And, and Sean and I came to faith under very different circumstances. Sean came to faith in a movement that we would call cessationist, which basically the people who led him to the Lord believe that, that God doesn't heal like this anymore. And I came to faith in a very hyper-charismatic movement where people had the expectation that everybody's going to be healed, which I don't think is true, by the way. But, um, and so we would just, like, like, we were at these polar ends, okay, and, and, and we would just butt heads on this constantly, and we would debate, and, and, and like, almost as though God was on trial, like, fervently, all right, and, and, and the, the hard part was this, okay, okay, there's not a verse in the Bible that teaches that God stopped doing supernatural stuff, all right, like you should just know that. Like when some people are like, listen, like, okay, we know that like God doesn't heal like that way. He doesn't give gifts of healing anymore. He doesn't give tongues. He doesn't do prophecies or whatever. There is not a text of scripture that shows that. I mean, like, like what it comes from, and, what, and I remember having this day with Sean where I finally just said, well, listen, honestly, he goes, the issue I have with that is simply put, um, I've never seen a miracle. And it just came down to that. Okay, like, listen, at the end of the day, like, okay, you're, you're, like, you're telling me that that God still does it, but man, listen, man, I'm a Christian. I've never seen a miracle. So therefore, and, this, and by the way, much of the satiist argument comes down to personal experience. And the other part of it is this and, this, and this is what Sean would say, because people who loved him told him this. 
He would say, listen, the reason the, like those, and it's always a weird divide they create with in terms of this, like there's supernatural gifts and not supernatural gifts because scripture doesn't make that distinction. So like they would say like, no, yeah, no, God still gives us gifts of teaching, not tongues or interpretation or healing or miracles. Um, and he'll say, and they would say this, um, if you, like, if you were to study church history, what you would find is God gave those gifts to the apostles and those on whom the apostles laid their hands for the establishing of the church. And once the church was established, those gifts were no longer needed, therefore they're done. And so this is an argument that stems from an ignorance about church history. In other words, if we were to like, go into church history and I could show you people in church history who are well after the apostles performing spiritual gifts, that would essentially destroy this argument, right? Because you'd see it right there. Well, guess what? Those exist. Like there are firsthand accounts that I'm gonna show you today. But before we get there, here's one thing I wanna say. This is why I just wanna put you, like, Bert, why are you pushing back so hard on this idea of like, does God still give gifts of healing? Like that? Um, because it's not, it's not a salvation issue. And I just wanna be clear, like those who disagree with me on this, in my eyes, they're my brothers. You got reverence for the word. You believe that Jesus has died for your sin and rose from the dead. You believe in salvation by grace through faith uh, in Christ alone. In, in my eyes, we're the same family. Like, I, I really believe that. So I'm not suggesting that somebody disagrees with me here that, uh, that they're outside of the faith. I wouldn't be so arrogant in, in that way. But the reason I want to take some time to today just punch at this a little bit is because, number one, there are churches here around us that teach this. You have friends, family members who believe this, and you're going to encounter it if you start doing the kingdom stuff. And so to guard you, I want you to see why it's false. And number two, the reason I want to take some time on this is, is really quite simple, because there's a lot riding on it. Like, look, man, if God still heals the sick, we have loved ones who are sick. Don't you want to be sure that he does that? Like, if God still speaks supernaturally to people, and I tell you, you can hear God today. Don't you want that to, I've, like, it's, if it's true, that's amazing. And if not, we're fellowshipping with demons. So like, no, there's a lot riding on this. That's why I want you to know this. It's not so that we can just like have like a great argument. No, it's because this is pretty important. And so look, at the, at the outset of it, and here's, by the way, the cessationist argument has shifted through the years. It used to be, well, uh, like God stopped giving gifts, but now what they'll say is, well, God might still do the miraculous, but I wouldn't say that it's a gift. It's a semantic thing. So let me just tell you why that, 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 that argument doesn't fly. Um, you might remember when we were going through 1 Corinthians, we kept bringing up 1 Corinthians 12, 7, which says this, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. In other words, like as Paul is categorizing spiritual gifts, he doesn't call them things that God just throws at us from nowhere. Instead, what a spiritual gift is, is a revealing of God's presence. That's the idea of manifestation, right? It's the Greek word phanerosis. What it means is an unveiling. In the same way, like if, if there could be angels in this room, but without a manifestation, you wouldn't know that they're there. Well, that's what spiritual gifts are. They're a revealing of the presence of the Lord among us, ways that he shows that he is here. Now, let, let, let me just hammer this in for one more second. I promise I'm gonna get to the fun stuff, okay? All right. The reason this is important is because we do not believe that spiritual gifts are like Jedi powers. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it's a thing of like God just sort of puts this thing in my heart and it's removed from his presence or himself. No, 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 no. A spiritual gift is a working of the Holy Spirit that he chooses to do around you and around me. But it's all him. It's all him. So this is why, like, this, like, semantics thing of, well, he might do miracles, but they're not gifts. The reason that's wrong is that it inherently misunderstands what spiritual gifts are. Like, and so it's not wrong to ask, does God still do these things? Because that's the question. Not does God give gifts, but does God do this stuff? You understand? Okay, so back to the idea of church history, all right? I, I want to just read you some of the church fathers and then people throughout church history. And you should just know them. First one I'll read to you is from a guy named Irenaeus. Irenaeus was born about 125 AD. Essentially, he was born 60 years after Paul died, okay? And he writes uh, this book uh, called Against Heresies, uh, sometime between 174 and 189 AD. So we're talking way after the apostles are gone and almost certainly after those whom the apostles had laid their hands were dead. And listen to how Irenaeus describes 
the early church that he is living in in that moment. He says this. He says, those who are in truth, his disciples, talking about the Lord, receiving grace from him, do in his name perform miracles. So as to promote the welfare of other men, according to which the gift uh, which each one has received from him. For some do certainly, look how he's talking in present tense, do certainly and truly drive out devils so that those uh, who have thus been cleansed from evil spirits frequently both believe in Christ and join themselves to the church. Others have foreknowledge of things to come. They see visions and other prophetic expressions. Others still heal the sick by the laying their hands upon them, and they are made whole. Yea, moreover, as I have said, the dead have even been raised up and remained among us for many years. What more shall I say? It is not possible to name the number of gifts which the church scattered throughout the whole world has received from God in the name of Jesus Christ, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and which she exerts day by day for the benefit of the Gentiles, neither practicing deception upon any nor taking any reward from them on account of such miraculous uh, interpositions. For as she has freely received from God, freely also does she minister to others. Okay, so what's he saying? All right, the church is being gifts or giving gifts of the Holy Spirit, supernatural, casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead, prophetic utterances, okay? And when they do it, it's not for financial gain. They're not putting on a, a Christian show where, hey, if you give me money, then I'll pray for your sick person. No, no, as they've been like freely received, they freely give. That's the church that Irenaeus lived in. I'll go on. This next one comes from Origin of Antioch who was born about 185 AD, lived about 254 AD. And this, what we're about to read here is against, it's called Against Celsus, it, he, Celsus was an early heretic. And this book was written at, at 248 AD. So we're talking well past this idea of the apostles and those on whom they laid their hands. And he says this, and there are still preserved among Christians traces of that Holy Spirit which appeared in the form of a dove. In other words, like, like talking about how like, you know, Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit came down on him in the form of a dove, and he's going, that, that same Holy Spirit is here, and here's how we see him. They expel evil spirits and perform many cures and foresee certain events according to the will of the Logos, which is the word, Jesus. And although Celsus, or the Jew whom he has introduced, may treat with mockery what I am going to say, I shall say it nevertheless that many have been converted to Christianity as if against their will, some sort of spirit having suddenly transformed their minds from a hatred of the doctrine to a readiness to die in its defense. In other words, the Holy Spirit just converts people and makes them go from hating God to loving him. And having appeared to them either in a waking vision or dream of the night. He doesn't stop there. You go forward in the book, he says this, and the name of Jesus can still remove distractions from the minds of men and expel demons and also take away diseases. Well, after the fact. By the way, I'm not expecting you to memorize these. I just want you to know that these are here. So when somebody says to you, well, like, listen, church history shows, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. I'll continue. Um, one of my favorite uh, church fathers is a guy named St. Augustine. I really, really enjoy the, the writings of Augustine. Augustine uh, lived in, in the, the fifth century, thereabouts. Um, and Augustine, I mean, he's a really, really keen intellect. He's a philosopher. He, he wrote all really neat things. But Augustine, early in his Christian life, was a cessationist. Like, he believed that the gifts of the Spirit had stopped. And then he started to see the stuff that God was doing supernaturally. And he had to convert from it. He had to go, listen, actually, I was wrong. All right? And so in his book, City of God, one of the things that he does is he accounts for, if you can believe this or not, he accounts for more than 70 miracles in his city. Like 70 times, like they have like prayed and they've seen God super, like do supernatural stuff. And we're not talking like little things of like somebody had a migraine and then, and then God healed. Although praise God for when he heals migraines. Um, no, we're talking about like blind eyes being opened, dead people being raised, like deaf ears coming open, like really, really incredible things. And it gets to the point in City of God where Augustine is just tired of writing stuff. I'm not even kidding you. And so here's what he says uh, in City of God. He says this, what am I to do? I am so pressed by the promise uh, of finishing this work. And, and again, this is written about uh, 413 AD. So well after that first window. Okay, what am I to do? I am so pressed by the promise of finishing this work that I cannot record all the miracles I know. <laughs> right? 
I, 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 guys, I, I have to stop. I could go on. I, please, for the love, like, let me stop, okay? All right, the miracles I know. And doubtless several uh, of our adherents, when they read what I have narrated, will regret that I have omitted so many which they, as well as I certainly know. Even now, I beg these persons to excuse me and consider how long it would take for uh, me to relate all those miracles, which the necessity of finishing this work I have now undertaken forces me to omit. In other words, he's saying, I know some of you guys are going to get mad at me that I didn't include your favorite story. I'm sorry. I'm, guys, I'm just out of time. I have to keep moving on. So please forgive me if, like, okay, what about this guy? Or what about that girl, Augustine? Like, why you include that? He goes, I just, there is only so much paper and so much. I have to stop. All right. That's the recording of St. Augustine. And I know the pushback. The pushback will go something like this, because if, if you look at some of the miracles that, that he, he puts in there, you'll see stuff. I mean, like, it might have to do with veneration to the saints. It might have to do with, uh, like, the bones of a, of a church uh, saint or figure and God healing somebody around them. And, and what happens is this. People will look at that, and they'll be like, see, listen, there are people who are practicing miracles like Catholics. Therefore, those miracles are not authentic because their theology had bad stuff in it. And I would just remind you of a few things. Number one, um, we serve an incredibly compassionate and gracious God. This is the same God who, when Moses intentionally disobeyed him about speaking to a rock and he stroked it, God still brought water from the rock for his people. You know why? Because they needed a drink. All right. Um, this is the same God. Let me, let me say it like this. This is the same God, you, you, even as we've been reading through Acts, right? And we're seeing all these healings take place. At this point, like, literally, like today, the story was, right? Like that everybody was healed. Okay, same God who's healing around those disciples. Those disciples at this point are, I'm just gonna say, they're really racist. Like they believe that like, unless you're a Jew, you're not gonna be saved. Like it's gonna mess with them later on. And yet God is still doing the miraculous around them. Um, and I, I mean, think about this. This is the same God who Jesus, like he sends out his disciples into the towns. Remember this story is in the gospels and he's like, go out two by two, heal the sick, raise the dead, announce the kingdom of God is here. And this is even with them still believing that he was a military general. That's what they thought about Jesus. Like fundamentally didn't understand like the nature of Jesus' mission. And yet the Lord's like, there are people in need. I will meet that need. And so, and so the mistake is to go, well, listen, because these miracles in Augustine don't affirm the theology that I want, they are invalid. And what you're saying is God lacked compassion for people in that age. And so unless they believed it all the right way, he wasn't going to heal the sick, which is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. I've said this to you before. I will say it again. Here's the big thing that we have to understand when we're talking about spiritual gifts, like in the positive and negative sense. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Gifts don't confirm doctrines. Let me say it again. Gifts do not, they don't confirm doctrines. It's a mistake if somebody's got a prophetic gifting to assume that, okay, because they've got a prophetic gifting, that means everything that they teach has got to be inerrant. That would be wrong because they might not have a gift of teaching. They might not know the Bible. And if what they say contradicts the Bible, they're wrong. It's a mistake to say, oh, listen, because somebody has a healing gift, therefore, if they've got a healing gift, everything that they say or do or believe is right. Nope, they're in formation just as much as everyone else. The only doctrine that spiritual gifts affirm is that Jesus is the Lord, that he died for our sin and rose from the dead. That's the only one. Everything else, you have all kinds of like bad theology and bad practice because gifts are precisely, precisely that. They're gifts. They're not given to us because of our own character. They're not given to us because of our own godliness. They're given out of the kindness and compassion of our God who looks at his children with love and says, yes, says, yes. And so when you come to these stories, you're like, well, it can't be true because of this. It's a mistake because gifts don't function that way. I can go on. You're like, well, Bert, you're telling me about like, stories from way back in the 4th and 5th century. You're telling me about like from across the ocean and in Africa. Like, well, listen, we're Americans. God do anything here? And as a matter of fact, yes. Maybe you've heard of a guy named John Wesley. Father of the, of the Methodist movement. Uh, preacher during the first great awakening. Right? I mean, so we're talking about 1742, uh, particularly the, the thing I'm about to read you. Uh, he wrote this here in the States. Wesley, who, who like the, the Holy Spirit just ignited his heart, empowered him for ministry. Did you know that Wesley's ministry also went hand in hand with some crazy supernatural stuff? 
We don't talk about this very much. Like that, that Wesley was known for like, just so that you understand, Wesley was known for as he was preaching, people being so overwhelmed by the presence of the Holy Spirit, they would just collapse to the ground. Sometimes, and like sometimes screaming, sometimes dramatically. Yeah, like, like, like a Pentecostal service. <laughs> Maybe not that much, but... But, 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 he, but it was so notable for him, in fact, that actually other like, famous uh, preachers from the time would actually come out to try to correct him because they couldn't believe, like I'm thinking particularly of like George Whitfield. George Whitfield came to Wesley and he's like, you, like you, what are you allowing? You need to stop. And then when Whitfield saw what happened, he was like, actually, okay, no, that's of God. Because the guy would fall to the ground a drunk and he'd get up sober for the rest of his life. Let me read you a story. This is from, from the Journal of John Wesley. And here's a little bit of the background. So the, the journal, uh, what we're about to read about is the story of, of uh, John Wesley and a guy named Mr. Merrick. They were both preachers. And what ended up happening, because they're, they're traveling by horseback and they're going around in the rain, all kinds of places. And both of them contract a uh, cold or a flu. They both, like a virus, they both get really, really sick. Uh, Wesley recovers from it. And Merrick, it gets worse. And so... Uh, he, he goes to visit the house of Mr. Merrick, and here's what it says uh, in his journal. It says, when I came home, they told me the physician had said he did not expect Mr. Merrick would live till the morning. I went to him, but his pulse was gone. He had been speechless and senseless for some time. A few of us immediately joined in prayer. I relate the naked fact. Before we had done, his sense and his speech returned. Now that he will account for this by natural causes has my free leave, but I chose to stay. This is, or sorry, I chose to say, this is the power of God. So in other words, okay, Merrick starts to turn like he's, like they pray for him and he turns around, like he gets his senses back. He's able to start speaking again. We're like, wow, God raised this guy up. He healed him. And that's what it looked like for a moment. It looked like, okay, God had healed this guy, but Merrick, like he gets a little bit better and then he starts to go back down. He starts to, to like uh, basically approach death's door. And you say, well, well, why? Well, just watch. So after he has this decline, Wesley goes back. And now this is on, <laughs> if you believe this, this is from his journal on Christmas Day, 1742. And here's what it says. I went up and found them all crying about him. Talk about Merrick. His legs being cold and, as it seemed, dead already. We all kneeled down and called upon God with strong cries and tears. He opened his eyes and called for me. And from that hour, he continued to recover his strength till he was restored to perfect health. I wait to hear who will either disprove this fact or philosophically account for it. That's boss, right? Like mic drop. God raised a guy from the dead and Wesley's like, I'm waiting for somebody to say that he didn't. Like, that's awesome. And by the way, Merrick lived for decades after that. So the question becomes, okay, listen, why is it that we don't believe that God still does this stuff. If the, if the Bible doesn't teach that he stopped, if church history doesn't teach that he hasn't, why is it that we don't believe that this still happens? I want to tell you why. It's because like across the board, I think it's uh, Jack here that wrote this one time. He said, like, when pe people become cessationists because somebody that they trusted told them so. That's why. Like, I, I was listening to an interview with Max Licato this week. Max Licato, who used to be a cessationist, and, and he's come out of that. And when, and when asked why, he said, well, because, like, the people who led me to the Lord, that's where they were. He says, it's, just, it's just true. Listen, if you're converted by a donut, you'll become a donut. And, and, and I'm not speaking ill of anybody, like, who, who influenced your life. Just what I'm telling you is in this area, they were wrong. They were absolutely wrong. God is healing on the earth right now. Look, hey, you want to know where the biggest church like revival and renewal and just like explosion is taking place? China. Like unquestionably, like, like it's just spreading like wildfire as people convert to the gospel over and over and over again. And the question becomes, okay, why? Why is it people are, are turning to the Lord in droves in a place that is so clearly hostile to the Christian faith? To the point, there, there's actually a guy from Oxford who went to go study that exact question. So not a fringe, like Christian public, like Oxford, okay? Um, and his name was Gothard Ublo, I think that's how you say his name. I'm going to put it on the screen in a minute because I have no idea how to say this guy's name. All right, but here's what he found. The reason why, like, the church was growing so rapidly in China, there wasn't even a question about it. Here's what he says. Um, he says, divine healing, understood as both the restoration of physical bodies and a more holistic sense as the transformation of individuals and communities may be the single most important factor 
explaining the extraordinary growth of Christianity in China. Why are people converting? Because they were sick or somebody that, okay, there's, I, that's a huge little bibliography thing there. You gotta have its own slide. Okay. Why, why are people converting to Christianity in droves in China? Because they were sick or somebody that they loved were sick and God healed. That's incredible, right? Can, can I just tell you, like, why, like, if the experience thing is what makes you say, all right, listen, God uh, doesn't heal anymore. My, my always pushback is, well, how many sick people have you prayed for? Because like, here's what I know. Like, if you want to see the Lord stretch out his hand, you got to pray for somebody. And something that I love about the Lord is how incredibly gracious and compassionate and, and healing he is. Again, I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that everybody gets healed. If you know me, you know I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that we won't lose people that we love. We absolutely will. And it's awful. It's absolutely awful. And I'm also not saying, by the way, that if you just have enough faith... You can make God do anything. That's nonsense. Biblical faith is objected towards a person, not you knowing something. Like if, you, if, you, like if, you're, if you're sick or you have a friend or a relative who's sick, okay, and you ask Jesus to heal them because you believe that he can, biblically speaking, that is all the faith that you need. If we're talking about like, like, what is it, like what's healing faith? It's that, believing that Jesus is a healer. Okay. But I gotta tell you, I've seen him heal. A couple of weeks ago, man, I, 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 my friend Dawson, this is really cool. So um, he's, he, here's what I love about the Lord. He heals people in ways that I wouldn't do it. Like my, my friend Dawson, before he came to know the Lord, um, he, he had this really re- rebellious time in his life where he actually did like just a ton, a ton of drugs, like just so many of them to the point where like, like when we're talking with like cocaine, like it actually destroyed his like things in his nasal cavity. All right. And, and, and it was like to the point where like, he said whenever he was on a plane, it was like somebody would be like jamming an ice pick up into his head because of how bad it was. A couple weeks ago, I was in the room when people prayed for him. And he said it felt like things just shifted inside his face. Got on the plane, flew home to Texas, no issues whatsoever. I mean, like, I'm not telling you the stories uh, that, that just that other people have seen. I'm telling you the ones that I've seen. Hey, right now in this room are people that like, we have prayed for and we have seen God heal. You know, I, I could tell you of my niece who's sitting right over here where she went through a terrible, she knows what I'm going to say this, went through a terrible car accident, right? And, and there was a point where she, like her, her right arm was paralyzed, okay? And we prayed for her and guess what? She, like, I remember, Tammy, you remember this, like sending me the video? Like, like, cause at the same time, the same time we prayed for her, she was, she was up, well, uh, it, where, that wasn't Christianity. Where, it was Christianity, okay. Same time she was at Christianity, okay. So, like same time, like we pray for her, suddenly her hand starts moving again. Like, like she's right there, okay. I mean, we, we got another person in the room, like one of my favorite things I've ever seen God do, okay. Um, we, we had a Sunday morning where like we're, we're closing out service and um, not gonna cry. I'm not Josh. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Bella, are you in here? Did you hear me? Okay, so look, I'm just messing with you. He's going to fire back with that next time he preaches. <laughs> look, look. I'm in this room and uh, go to close out the service in prayer. And uh, when I do, um, I have just this, uh, we would call it a mental vision. Picture flashes in my mind of an ankle. And I'm like, huh, all right. So I say, hey, anybody here have an ankle issue? And you jerks, nobody raised their hands. But it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm just messing with you. Um, so I, I'm like, I don't want to do this. I'm just going to pray for an ankle. So pray for an ankle. And a couple hours after church, I get a phone call from a lady um, just saying, like, oh, my gosh. She's like, it was me. She's like, you know, she, she had uh, developed this ankle problem. And um, I found out later on um, she was at the point in her life in believing that basically, like, she had a friend who, who was suffering from cancer who, who ultimately, she did, she died. Um, but she was at this point in her life where she just believed God doesn't heal anymore. And, and when we prayed and asked the Lord to heal her ankle, she said, like, suddenly it's like her ankle began to heat up. And she turned to her husband, and she's like, it's me, it's me, right? And then she said this thing to me on the phone that I probably, I, I will never forget as long as I live, because it just meant the world to me. She said, I always thought that I was somebody whose prayers God didn't hear. And he showed her that wasn't true. How many of us feel that way? Come on. We think, okay, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. He doesn't hear me. Oh, he hears you more than you could ask him to. 
He hears, like, there's a reason that Jesus says we'll give an account for every carelessly spoken word. Like, he hears even the words we don't care about him hearing. But he hears. Can I, like, can I just tell you, like, why we believe that the Lord heals? We believe that he heals because he's good and compassionate. And he doesn't change. That's what Hebrews says. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His heart and who he has revealed himself to be in the Gospels is exactly who he is today. He's still compassionate. He's still gracious. He's still good. He still wants to set his people free. He's still advancing his kingdom. And here's the cool part. He's still able to meet us where we are. I, near the beginning, I, I told you the story of my friend Sean and how he used to be a cessationist. And he would say, like, well, I've, just, I've never seen a miracle. About 15 years later, he was in Ghana. He was on a missions trip. And on a Friday night, they were having a worship service. And uh, a gentleman came in uh, with a cane, uh, wearing a, I think it's called a hijab, like a Muslim cap. And his leg, through whatever injury, probably breaking it, his leg was completely twisted around. And he came up to the front, and the, the missionary, the pastor, asked him, he said, you know, like, why are you here? And the guy said, I'm here because I want to see if your Jesus can heal me. And, and, and now let's just, let's just rubber meets the road. The pastor asked him, he said, okay, well, if he does, will you renounce Allah? And the guy said, yes. I said, okay. So the church circled around him, and they prayed for him. They asked him, they asked the Lord to heal him. And the guy suddenly felt a strength in his leg that he didn't have before. And he threw down his cane. And the pastor said, now walk. And as he's walking, his leg began to untwist. And the pastor said, now run. And as he ran, Sean saw with his own eyes, okay, like, as he ran the leg completely untwisted and he was able to run around and just tear streaming down his face, completely healed. That was Friday night. Sunday night, he came back to church, took his hijab and threw it to the ground and said, never again. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is why we pray for his kingdom to come. It's not so that we can have an entertaining church service. It's not so that we can feel personally validated if God like, does something when we pray. It's because he doesn't change. As we wrap up today, I know I'm going a few minutes long. As we wrap up today, I want to give you an opportunity. Like, if, if you're willing with this, if you're not, that, that, it's okay. I don't mean to put anybody on the spot, but here's what I'm going to say. If you are sitting here today, and you have a need in your body for physical healing. What I want you to know is that this is not a thing of like the anointed evangelist or church leader. No, in fact, the church in China that we talked about, it's a culture of healing. It's not that the pastor prays, it's that the church chooses to pray all the time, like people of the church, okay? So here's what I wanna ask you. If you need healing in your body, would you stand up? And we're gonna pray for you. Praise God. Praise God for you guys. Okay, church, I'm going to ask you guys to be bold, okay? You see these people standing up around you? I want you to get up out of your seats and just go over and you're going to just like gracefully lay hands on, just put your hand on their shoulder, okay? If, if like if you want to pray for healing for them, get up like wherever you see a person standing. I want you to get up out of your seats right now and move towards them. Let's go. to be the body. Anybody needs healing that no one is laying their hands on? Throw your hand up if, if we're missing anybody. Got everybody? Okay. We're just going to take a second. Holy Spirit, come. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. We ask you to heal. 
brothers, sisters who are praying, what I want you to hear is this is not a thing of if I just pray the right words, he will. No, that would be a spell. We're asking God to heal. He's a real person. We're just, we're just bringing a request to him right now. We are announcing healing in Jesus' name. And so right now, just go ahead. Like all around the room, I want you just to start asking God to heal the people that you're praying for. Go ahead. Let them know that you're doing it. Do it out loud, not in your head, okay? I'm just going to speak for a second here. Um, you keep praying. Um, just the scriptures, they talk about uh, there, there are different kinds of things that need to be healed. Sometimes a physical ailment uh, comes from just injury, life wear and tear, uh, just being a human being. Other times uh, its source is demonic in origin. I'm thinking of in the Gospel of Luke, it says there was a woman who was bent over uh, because an evil spirit had afflicted her. And so I just want to take a second. In the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of his blood, I command any unclean spirit that has afflicted any of these people to leave now. Lord, we thank you because you see your kids. And you are a good father. We love you. Thank you for the healings that you've done this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.